So welcome everyone. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us. My name is Sherwood Smith, he, him pronouns. I'm Senior Executive Director for Diversity in the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I work as Senior Executive Director for Inclusive Excellence and Faculty Development. And this program is in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day at the University of Vermont. I wanna start out with a brief land acknowledgement. University of Vermont is located on the lands and waters which have long served as meeting places for exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years. It's the home of the Western Abenaki. UVM seeks to honor, recognize, and respect these people throughout the world, especially the Abenaki, as traditional stewards of the lands and waters. With these intentions, we will begin today with this land acknowledgement by the institution. Many in the UVM community are guests on this land. The institution's role as a guest is to respect the lands and waters the, and the indigenous knowledge interwoven within them and to uplift indigenous peoples and their cultures presence in this land and within our communities as educators and stewards. While land acknowledgement is essentially just a starting point, there is much work ahead for all of us as we come to terms with the legacies, histories and traumas in the indigenous communities around us. So thank you. The intention was that everyone had an opportunity to, oops, I gotta do two things at once here, sorry. Oh, even better. Thank you. Um, I wanna do some introductions. Um, first, I wanna thank Masha, who is the administrative assistant in the vice provost office, who's helped to organize this entire event. So we can give her a round of applause. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank the Vice Provost, um, Dr. Amir Ahmed, who is here, and the Provost, Patty Prelock, for willing to attend this event, as long with, I see another, a bunch of other friendly faces. And I want to thank my panelists. So the intention of this event is not to focus specifically on Vermont. Um, I'm hoping all of you have watched the film, but the film really focuses on I believe five different indigenous peoples, cultures, and the ways that they've worked for sustainability. So the panel here, I've invited them because their work relates to sustainability, and I've asked them to speak from their own perspective. So they're not trying to represent all the different indigenous people, and they're certainly not experts on everything around and about Vermont, but they both are intimately involved in this work of sustainability looking at culture and the ways that cultures have attempted to preserve their own ways of life, given the environments in which they're working in. So, Tony Diamanto is a professor of forestry in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, his research really centers on what's called viviculture, which is looking at how brand, a particular branch of forestry that looks at how the development and care of forests relates to traditional cultures and experiences and how it seeks to better maintain and manage forests in the current environmental changes we're operating in. Holly LaFrance La is, is a citizen of the Missisquoi Band of the Abenaki, also serves on their board of directors. She works with the communities here in Vermont as a key kaweno, which is someone who garden, is a guardian of the lands. I had a chance to work with her and learn from her as she works with both the Ethan Allen Homestead and also the UVM farm. And that's how we got connected. And I would ask, the process is gonna be, I'm gonna try to ask one question. We've got people virtually here as well. So I'm gonna bounce back and forth and take questions virtually in the room. Please come on in and get a seat, unless you really like standing. So, once we start, if you have a general question, that's fine. I will bring you a mic just to make sure everybody can hear you. So just give me a second to get to you with the mic if you're in the room. All right. I would ask that people take turns. If you're one of those people that likes to ask a lot of questions, please give a moment for other people to ask theirs. All of us are speaking from our own experience. Uh, 
in the world of modern technology, if you've got cell phones, please put them on silent uh, so we're not disrupted by them. And I would say that um, be open to new and different ways of looking at the world if this is a new experience for you. All right. So you've both had a chance to watch the film. I'd like you both to just take a minute and share from your own perspective what is it that stood out in the film that you would hope an audience would take away? What is it about this film that struck you as something important for an audience to take away from watching a film like this? Who might This might be the first film they've watched on this issue. So what I took out of it was um, that we really need to change what we're doing because we're basically killing each other. Um, our people used to um, grow things for themselves and do things and not pollute, you know, pollute the land, pollute the waters, kill the animals. We only killed for what we had to eat. And I think that's the important thing that I saw. It was a really sad, I don't know if you all watched it, but it was a really sad film. It, it, I had tears in my eyes when I was watching it because it's, just, you know, it's, it's very important that we need to change our ways. That's what I got out of it. So, let me move it away so I'm not here. Yeah, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be up here as part of this. Um, you know, really, the the way I viewed it was was from my perspective, which has really been a pretty biased one in terms of um, relationship with the environment, and and I've been really fortunate to have partnerships and friends with friendships with uh, Native people to get a better understanding of a different way of looking at the world. And I think that film really highlights that, which is, I think I was trained and many of us are trained to think wilderness is a place that's free of people, you know, old growth forest that's never been impacted by humans. And that's kind of this idealized sense of what the natural world should be from a very Western standpoint. And, and those that watch the film and certainly those that live the experience know that from indigenous culture, um, we are part of the ecosystem, and so how we think about our relationships with the environment, our role in stewarding, stewarding the environment is very much less of a visitor and more of a participant. And I think that really changes the ways in which we think about honoring th those relationships um, with the natural world. And so I really appreciated throughout that film um, the connection of being part of the ecosystem versus a visitor or, or a steward that's bringing an outside Western perspective. Thank you both. Now to you all, who has a question? Thank you. Kwe Kwe, my name is Justin Salisbury, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy, a uh, student here at UVM. But I wanted to ask, you know, a lot of times when we talk about the relationship of indigenous peoples and land, um, you know, a lot of times we are, we're doing that from kind of a colonial perspective in the first place of thinking about it as purely just being the land. Um, and so I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the relationship among indigenous peoples and watersheds, um, about indigenous peoples and other parts of the ecosystems around us. Do I know anything about that? Not, not really. So I, I guess uh, just speaking from, again, uh, I've been fortunate to spend time on the Menominee Reservation and work with the Menominee people on their ancestral lands. And so that portion of the film, those that did watch it, I think really speaks to looking at that as a, both the watershed, but again, beyond the value of that land, maybe from a Western perspective, when we're focusing on the trees and, and thinking about the ecosystems and more broadly what those elders bring in terms of their values from water, water filtration, water purification, and thinking at broader scales. And, and I think just with fire in general, which is a big theme, 
a lot of the discussion um, in that film and more broadly just our understanding of indigenous use of fire, both in the boreal ecosystems, they certainly focused a lot on, on California, but also in other parts of the, the globe, uh, like Australia, fire as a mosaic across that landscape. So it's not just a single area being burned, but it's basically thinking about that as part of the ecosystem, part of the medicine that that tribe is using as a way to both protect and sustain various aspects of that watershed. And so the scales beyond just a, a given place, but really the entire kind of component of, of that, that that place. But that's my interpretation of it again from, from my perspective, but certainly um, how it's been described um, in, in the video as well as elsewhere. I don't know. It's, well, um, the the river that they showed, and I can't remember the man's name. Sorry. Um, how it sustains the forest, and and they clear burn or control burn to get rid of you know all of the stuff on the bottom. So the so it helps you know the fish because it cools off the water and and gets rid of the bugs and things. So that's something that I guess they're doing again, but they got away from it. Um, and I won't say that's why California's burning, but that's why there's a lot of forest fires because they're not clear burning or controlled burning. Did that answer your question? And I'm Mi'kmaq also. And I went to Passamaquoddy last year. It was awesome. Not that that's good doing that anything, but are you from Maine? Yeah. Sorry to pick on you. Okay. Other folks? Yeah, I'm a professor in another life. I could ask how many of you have actually watched the film before you came, but I won't do that. Oh, I got a question. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Kate. Uh, I work here at UVM. As I was watching the film, I was trying to understand or, or plan out how the adoption of all these practices uh, could be accomplished in the current environment. I mean, I, th I think the film is very telling in the fact that if, if the white man had not followed things up along the way and everybody just kept going in the same manner that things would have probably worked out better in terms of the environment. But now that we have cities with millions of people in it and, and a much larger population, the question is, can all of that be done on a large scale with, without in fact turning it into a mass production effort as opposed to the smaller activities that, that are currently going on. I, when I was thinking about the, the, um, the piece on timber, I, I was thinking, okay, that that looks to some degree like Vermont's current use program and, and that sort of thing. But um, in terms of the agriculture and growing produce, I think it feels like it gets more complicated. So if you could just speak to that. So what do you mean by what's more complicated? What, how we're growing, how no, no, the colonists I mean, are growing things or how the natives are growing things? No, I, th I think for me, what I'm saying is, is can you produce at the level that is now required because of the much larger population that we're trying to serve? Part, part, of, part of how we've managed to produce so much food in this country has been this kind of the mass production and the corporate farms and all this sort of thing. So do you believe there's a way to use the native approaches in a way that could offset a, a major portion of what's cur currently going on on these corporate farms? Good question. Um, well, like you said, there's millions and millions and millions of people. Um, the, the natives, the we basically try to sustain our you know our self sustainability for ourselves. I don't know if it would work because there's so many people and all I can think of is all these corporations that would get really upset if you know we took their ways of doing things and growing things and and doing it ourselves. That's why we and I know um 
we are going to the old ways and trying to teach people. I'm teaching people how to grow the way our ancestors did. So I I don't think that it would work. I mean, what do you think, Tony? Do you think that there's just so many people? How would it? I don't know. I think it would be a big upset with the with the Euro Americans if we did that. Yeah, and, and I think that the challenge is that that colonial model that was imposed upon, you know, already traditional ways of doing those things is really kind of set up this expectation that this amount of acres of land should yield this amount of corn or this many you know, bushels of corn or this acre of forest should yield this many two by fours. And, and so I think it's some of the, the challenges are that we do the spreadsheet and there's this many people and this much food needed in current areas of farming. And But I think there's also some lessons from the film in that as we deal with adapting to changing environmental conditions and still trying to sustain those values that there could actually be in some cases gains from shifting to those traditional approaches and that there's more resilience. Um, you know, the ability we were talking when we first showed up today about to even grow corn um, in the hope where the hope of your growing corn is amazing, um, given most of us would say that because we're spoiled in this very wet part of the world, that you, that's even possible. But I think there, there's a need to shift in general, whether it can yield the same amount of agriculture or not, even the, look at the Champlain Valley, you know, putting a few more trees into those fields, a few more perennial uh, species into those areas would do a lot for water quality. And so looking at food, um, you know, forest farms and those ideas that clearly have been around for millennia um, with these people have a lot of value, I think, for some of the modern challenges that that industrial scale agriculture um, brings. And so that might mean we need to actually do it on more lands or, or as I mentioned, with the examples from Hawaii, people doing it in their, their yards in, a, in an urban setting. So thinking differently about where we're even doing that. But I think the Menominee is a great example, you know, where that their tribal enterprise was established, you know, in 1909. So, you know, even selling wood for, for kind of commercial value from their lands is a newer adaptation of the tribe to kind of the, the, the policies around them that were forcing um, them to compete with the kind of capitalistic um, structures around them. And the way that has been integrated into Menominee is it's part of the well-being of the people. It's part of the well-being of, of the, you know, the, the environment. It's, and, and, it's, and it's also part of the well-being for um, kind of the, what, what they're doing there. And so it's still producing products, but it's doing it in a way that's thinking about the, the, the health of the, the, the community. So if we look at Vermont, where we send all of our wood to Canada or overseas or to Maine, or in New Hampshire, we, we don't, we kind of are broken even here, right? We have a lot of forests. We don't think about how that connects to the well-being of our rural communities and, and, in, our, and our local communities. So I think there's a lot even here that we could learn from that idea of, yes, it's a ecosystem, but that ecosystem includes the, the, the people and, and the economies within that. So I, I always take inspiration from, from that model and what they've been able to do there. I'll come to you. We have a question online, Masha. If um, the question from the online um, participant, how can I, a white settler colonial heritage person, researcher such as myself, reconcile living on a stolen land? I'm trying to be very conscious of politics of the situation uh, of this. So sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be very conscious of the politics of citation. So including indigenous authors in my dissertation, but it feels like not enough. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, could you read it again? Okay. Sorry. How can a white, in parenthesis, settler colonial heritage researcher, such as myself, reconcile living on stolen land? I'm trying to be very conscious of politics of citation, so including indigenous authors in my dissertation, but it feels like not enough. Does this person live in Vermont? I don't know if this person lives in Vermont. I can check. Okay. Because my answer would be to wherever you live to help your your native people, you know, go see them, see what they need. Um, you obviously can't do anything about the stolen land, you know, it was done a long time ago. Um, and I wouldn't feel guilty about living on stolen land, but that's what I would do. I would see what you can do for your own native community to help them maybe help them sustain themselves, you know, volunteer, what, whatever it happens to be. 
And I might just follow up that the it's a co-authorship, it really is about partnership and, and helping whether, you know, a line on an author. I mean, it's re really about what, what is, has impact and can be genuine, um, you know, assistance or in many cases just listening and learning. And so I, I, yeah, I wouldn't use make, making sure that you have indigenous co-authors, you know, as, as, a to as, as the as the criteria, really, it should be um, understanding, um, you know, where you are and, and what, what could be and lessons learned and then also um, where, where assistance could be you know, provided if that's something that's that's that's, that's asked for it, or needed. It never hurts to ask if someone needs help. For sure. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, in thinking about the, the movie, and these are five case studies, these stories, and they really tell a tale of, of kind of woe, but also possibility. And I'm wondering, what would be the, um, the case study for Vermont? What's the next case study? What's the next step that, say, the university and the Abenaki can do to work together to, um, to create a story like this or to do some reparation or reclamation or healing or future relationship building? Um, there's four recognized tribes in Vermont and we're trying to, um, to bring us all together to help people learn how to, how, you know, how to grow the old ways. Um, I don't know how UVM can help. Um, I don't want to go into something that's in the back of my mind and I'm, we're not going to talk about that, but, um, so maybe, I mean, now I know Sherwood and I know Tony, so maybe we can do something, you know, to help in, and educate people on the things that were, challenges that we're having, because there are lots of challenges. Yeah, I might just add, I, th I think just in, even in terms of our education and what we do, um, I reflected on how often we get enamored with the European roots of at least from you know the disciplines that we teach and and you know how many German forestry terms can you use to really be a true for and, and the irony is that you know we, we at the same time have so little understanding of traditional um, forest stewardship practices for Vermont certainly um, you know Wabanaki in, in Maine and you know and and, and Haudenosaunee and others, there, there's been more of discussion about that um, with, with and, and actually integration with the universities to, to learn more about those. But here at UVM, I'd say there's le been less of that. Um, and we often have this narrative, well, fire must have been important, but we don't ever really know um, like how it was used and, and where. And then certainly from an agricultural standpoint, the same idea. So I think there's a lot of learning from our side to, to really genuinely bring that into our curriculum beyond just the, yes, there's pitch pine here. There, we didn't. We never get lightning fires, so clearly there was an indigenous influence on this ecosystem. But we we really don't have any tangible um, kind of curricula that actually integrates that. So, thank you both. Uh, you mentioned that you are uh, teaching um, people uh, sustainability things. And so what exactly are you doing to teach people about um, the sustainability practices? I'm teaching them how to grow in the garden the old ways. So, so what do you mean by that? Well, we grow in mounds. Um, so we don't grow on the ground like the Hopi did, which that was really interesting to me. Um, we grow in mounds. The, the reason we do that is because it's better drainage. And we, we grow the three sisters, which is corn, squash, and beans. And we put in the spring, somebody goes fishing and they get fish. It's usually suckers or whatever. And they either put the whole thing in or they cut them in half and we put a hole probably about this, so the animals don't get it. We put the fish in the middle. That's to fertilize the mound. So instead of putting chemicals in, we use fish. And then we put the corn in, 
then we put the beans in, and then we put the squash. So the corn goes up first, the beans grow up the corn, and then the squash, I don't know if you, you ever touched a squash plant, it's really prickly, that goes around the edges to keep the, the weeds and the animals out of it. So that's what I am teaching people. Um, in a place where so many of us are non-native to the land, um, how can um, we learn about these practices that you're talking about in order to like feed our communities through growing in the way that works with this land that we live on without stealing those practices and exploiting them in ways that so learning they're not learning from us how to grow things is that what you're saying um we have something called vermont indigenous heritage center do you know what that is no. no. Okay. So it's basically within Ethan Allen Homestead because we we can't have land. We can't, you know, we can't have land. We can't build things. So that's where we are. Uh, we have classes. You can certainly come and join a class. You can come and volunteer for me as much as you want, and I will teach you anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then once growers learn those things, you can certainly do it. There's, there's nothing that's saying that you cannot grow the indigenous way at all. I would just add that there's been a big movement in terms of community gardens. There's also, I mean, even in New York now, they've got this high rise garden up on an old um, railroad bed. So there are ways in very urban centers that there are opportunities to provide more sustainable agriculture that people have begun to engage in. All right, I'll fill in the blank for just a moment. Oh. So at our university, um, you know, there have been um, there, there are some some troubling parts of our relationship with indigenous communities, um, Abenaki, but also others. Um, you know, some of it's kind of structural and bigger than us with the whole land grant university system and how that was created by Justin Morrill from Vermont. Um, some of that comes in with us being the, the primary engine of eugenics. Um, and, you know, we, we see that, um, you know, that there, there's been a lot of challenges in our relationship between our university um, and local indigenous communities. And so, my instinct is to look at healing that relationship as a primary vehicle to any kind of progress um, to work on any of these environmental things that that I think are our shared goals. So do you have any wisdom for us on what we can do as people inside the university to try to help um, build a healthier relationship between our university and local indigenous communities? Talk about the eugenics and the other stuff. You're allowed to talk. You're allowed to talk. You know, thanks, on. Okay, so the whole. You're allowed to talk about anything. I would say I brought the panelists because their their background is sustainability, not national politics. But, but the, you can that's talk about okay. Anything. I will talk about the eugenics and the other thing. Um, eugenics was vi my family were very involved in the eugenics thing. Um, my grandparents would not let him or any of his siblings talk about being Abnaki. They all went into hiding and I'm not going to talk about the old knack thing, but they were saying if you hide, then you're not real. But anyway, um, so everything was kept inside. They, they didn't, my grandmother was a healer, um, basically medicine woman, and she also was a midwife. Um, and she only did it for the Abnaki people. You know, they call the Abnaki woods. And that was it. So anyway, my father, none of them were allowed to talk about it at all. Um, and he 
when I grew up, I didn't know that I was Abnaki because he was afraid to tell me. So I didn't learn about it till I was in my teens, which is really sad because of this. And he, once I learned about it, he didn't want me saying it outside of the house for the same reason because it was still going on in Vermont in the 70s. They were still, they were taking children. They were so scared that they were going to take me, my brother, or my sister, or whatever, or any of his siblings. One of my aunts got sterilized because they were trying to wipe us out. They wanted, what, a new kind of people. So they were only doing it to Abnakis. I don't know if you know, but they were also doing it to Franco-Americans. So people from Canada were doing the same thing was happening to them. Or anybody that, you know, if you had a disability, they would sterilize you. You go in to have a baby, they would sterilize you and not tell you. They would do abortions. They would do some nasty things. And it, it really is a sad thing that they would try to wipe people out. I know they did it across the country, but so I have this kind of like, I like UVM and I don't like UVM because of the whole eugenics thing. And I know we got an apology, but you know, apology only goes so far. We started to heal about that, and then there was the whole Odin Act thing that they came basically saying that we were fake. And I'm sorry, but my family goes back for generations. I know who I am. I'm proud of who I am now. I wasn't, but I'm very proud of who I am and where I came from. And nobody can tell me I'm fake. Did that help? I know, I just got off on a whole eugenics thing. Actually, I can hear him without the mic. Yeah. It's not on again. Let's can you hear me? Up. All right. So yeah, I mean that that event that that you kind of hit on the where you know the university brought in speakers to call the Abenaki fake and everything. Right. That was in this room. I might know have I was been, here. I might was have here. Been, I was second row. Yeah, yeah. Might have been on that same tablecloth and and microphones well, they were that on you're a using. Little stage thing though. Yeah. So so but the. So, so like I was in that room Me too. that day too, right? And and I saw the police with the big guns and everything all around the room. You know, it was crazy. But so, given that like that's the context, right, of the relationships, I definitely want to 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 work on all the environmental things, things like protecting the common loon, things you know, for important spiritual bird. I want to work on all that stuff. But I got to figure out, like, what can I do or what can we do to help heal that relationship before, you know, because I feel like that's a pretext, right? Because if there isn't trust and there isn't communication, then all the environmental work in the world, even if we have the knowledge, can't happen. Right. So so can, can you think like, thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Definitely. Do you have any ideas of things that we can actively do to try to heal that relationship, though? Um, what, well, no, then it would have been like a cat fight. I was thinking if we could, ha if we would have had our own voice and there would have been some of us there in that room, well, there was a lot of us in that room incognito because nobody knew who we, who we were. Um, but we didn't get to give our side. I mean, as you know, you were there. So the first when I went, the first half was like, oh, this isn't bad. This is awesome. You know, I learned all this stuff about how they came down and, and made baskets. But the second half was terrible. It, it was, I know it was two people's opinions. That's what I have to think. But it was just, you know, having somebody say you're fake. You, you know, you basically don't exist. You're doing this to make money. Well, let me tell you, and I'll tell you all right now, Abnakis are not making money off anything. The government doesn't give us anything. You know, we're state recognized. That's it. Doesn't give us anything. You know, if you're federal recognized, you get, you know, grants. Well, actually, we do get grants, but you get money from the government. We don't get anything. You know, when people are so afraid we're going to make a casino, where I don't know where we're going to get the money to make a casino. Plus, we don't have land to make a casino because we can't own land. So I don't know how you can fix our relationship with the UVM. I mean, I felt better. Once the apology for the eugenics, even though I said, you know, apology doesn't really go that far. But then that other thing just, you know, blew 
us away. And, and people are still scared. We have people in in my group, Al Nabawi, which you didn't say Al Nabawi, did you? So I belong to this group called Al Nabawi, who's also part of Vermont Indigenous Heritage Center at Ethan Allen Homestead. So we're trying to bring back culture and, you know, and things. Um, and we have people in that group. We had actually had a celebration yesterday who will not wear regalia. They will not wear any of this stuff because they're scared that somebody say, you're not an Indian. You don't look indigenous to me because I've had people tell me that you're too white to be indigenous. And that's an awful feeling when somebody tries to say, well, you're not, you know, whatever. So I could say it to you, you're too light. You're, you can't be indigenous because you're too light colored. And this is a tan, believe it or not, like people. This is as dark as I get, but it's really, do you have people say that to you? That you're not indigenous? So doesn't that hurt you? Does it make you feel bad? See, I'm getting a thick, thicker skin because after that whole old knack thing, because I really, I didn't want to wear my regalia either for the same reason. But I'm like, they're not going to tell me who I am or what I am, where I came from. They don't know me. So I stopped. I was in regalia yesterday. Was I not sure what? I was, I was thinking about coming that way today, but I did not. <laughs> but I have my protection, you know. And so I don't, I don't know what to, how we can fix it. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Tell me what you think about it, both of you. Are. I think there's at least three pieces to this. I think one of the questions is institutionally, but look at the person sitting next to you. When you leave here, see how many people knew about the event. See how many people have actually engaged in their own learning about indigenous cultures, wherever they're from, whether it's California, Texas, Florida, New Jersey. Wisconsin, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So I think there's a there's an individual piece separate from the institutional piece first. And what have we done? What have I done as a person to try to build my own knowledge? I don't need to go ask anybody. I got a library. I mean, pity sakes, now you've got online. So you're, you're keystrokes away from information when I was had to go to the library. I think the second piece is, I'm not going to raise hands. How many of you belong to some club, organization, something? What is your own group done to be involved in some way? And about any issue of social justice, not just this one. And then, yes, I think the third thing is what what responsibilities do we have to the institutions we belong to? And those that's not a hierarchy, but I think that in my view, those are the three pieces to this puzzle. It's not just a, a question of the institution, because most of the people I would know say the institution doesn't control me. But it's not just me, because I often belong to organizations and institutions as well. So I, I think there are at least three parts, probably more to the question that you asked so well. Of, and relationships take time. And any of you, like me, that have been in relationships, relationships aren't like this. They tend to be more like, better like this, but sometimes they're like this. So I think also recognizing that relationships have their hard parts and their easy parts. And most of my learning comes from the hard parts, not from the easy parts. Are there any other questions? I still want to try to keep this focus somewhat on the, uh, this question about sustainability and what, what I brought these people here to sort of share from their experiences. Are there other questions having watched this film about sustainability, the environment, any of the issues the film brought up? Sherwood, there is a question from an online audience. Thank you, much. Exactly about that. Um, one thing that really stood out to me in the film was the connection between an orientation towards community and the land management slash stewardship. The film's case studies display a different cultural consciousness from the American mainstream, one that emphasizes interconnectivity and makes a compelling case for this mindset is crucial to addressing climate change. How can we work to shift this highly individualistic mainstream culture? That sounds like a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a great question. And and I guess the one aspect that I was struck by in the context of just 
there's a lot of discussion of prescribed fire, and, and, and we use the term prescribed fire, but cultural fire, maybe a better cultural burning, that from a individualistic approach, we're often thinking about reducing risk for wildfire, we're often thinking about, you know, how much fuel is out there, and, and really tying it to the medicines and the foods and the, the benefits to the broader community that are coming from that really to me stood out in that it's not just about some technician going out there to, to, to let a fire and kind of do what we often view as a target, but it's really tying it to there are many elements of community wellness that are tied to this that people understand and importantly are passing on kind of what you're describing with passing on the traditional planting approaches as well that many from age six to 96 recognize that the values and connections were I think the way we're set up right now, it's challenging to, to, to also have those similar connections within our society, but I, I do feel getting, maybe when I first started talking about people recognizing kind of our place within the natural environment versus just being outside of it and how we're connected to that, I think is a pretty key step for the, the colonial trained perspective um, and, and what those benefits might be. But I, it's, I don't know, it might be easier to shift some of the EVM policies and change that. It's a, it's a tricky one to, to restructure, but I think uh, making light of it, I think I think Sherwood's point is an excellent one that maybe just to comment on that last point, I don't let UVM's relationship with the Abenaki or like the, 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 the damage, including that event that I was pretty upset occurred uh, last year, get in the way of me connecting and learn this year sorry yeah april 29th april i remember 29th. very well I, to get get <laughs> like hold me back from trying to do these things so those that are in the audience that are saying um, my email address is at uvm the edu therefore i have this huge barrier in, in front of me um it, it's not a you know, you are you are working as an individual as well that cares about these things that should should follow that passion and not use your institution as, a, as a, something to hold you back from that so i think that's where some of that change can happen too, is, is just really trying to work beyond, um, you know, I think some of these preconceived notions that we can't do anything on, on these fronts because of that, that relationship, that historic damage. Thank you. Thank you both. Others? Thank you. Um, so I came here, I graduated high school in Hawaii where there's obviously a lot of ongoing um, tension about native sovereignty and um, in that case like the land really wasn't taken that long ago. It's a pretty recent history of oppression and um, indigenous erasure. So my question would be, you know, like there really is no substitute for land other than land. Like when we talk about decolonization, one of the main tenets of that is giving land back because that's such a huge part of culture. So how can we really make sustainable change um, and like sort of take indigenous practices into our daily lives if there isn't land for indigenous people to live on? And so without basically without that land back, do you think there can be effective sustainable solutions to sort of like indigenous culture revitalization? Hmm. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, I, I really don't know how to answer that. Um, I know now it's silent. Um, Well, hmm. I, I own my, I shouldn't say, I own my house, but I don't own my house. Um, so I guess as a, <clears throat> I belong to Missisquoi, we can't own land. Um, we have land, and I don't know how to answer that, but we have land, but it's not our land. It's in trust through the government. So like the state owns it. So the state basically bought it and says, this is in trust to you, so you can do what you want with it, but you can't own it. Um, I don't know how we can change that because it's politics. They don't want us to, again, when I was talking about the casino thing, that happened with Howard Dean. Um, that's, he didn't want us to, um, I mean, granted it happened a long time ago, but the, I remember Howard Dean saying he didn't want us to make a casino and 
you don't have money to make a casino, which is pretty funny. So I don't know how to answer. I don't know how to answer that. We have we're working with Ethan Allen Homestead, which is kind of interesting since we're you know Abnaki. We have gardens in back of it. We have. Did any of you know this? We have garden. I know Luke does because I can see Luke right there. Um, we have gardens back there. We have medicine. We're making a medicine woods. Um, we made a village. We now have a building that we're teaching classes. Um, indigenous classes, which anybody can go to. Just go to our, here, I'm going to make a plug. Go to allenbowie.org and you can see the classes that we're offering. There's one starting November 5th. Um, we're doing harvest class. Um, but we are growing things on there. We're growing things at UVM Horticultural Farm. Um, and we're also growing things at the Inneville Center behind their barn. We have a big, huge garden there that we're doing traditional planning and the interval is helping us do it. So does, I mean, I don't know what else to say, but did that help sort of? Yeah, I guess I might, I mean, I totally agree. There's no substitute for, for land. And, and so what we've at least observed recently is a lot more shared stewardship. Um, so like if you use St. Regis Mohawk as an example with Aquastasne, it's not a very large area, especially relative to their true ancestral lands, uh, but they have shared stewardship uh, um, relationships with New York DC who owns the land around them. And so it ends up being about 5,000 acres where they're practicing cultural approaches to um, stewardship, both of ash as well as other species. And with the Kirkwood tribe, even the examples there, um, that has been really shared exchange with prescribed fire spe specialists. Um, so historically, that's been less of a, I think, a collaborative agreement. And so it's a, a broader landscape that goes beyond, again, the federally recognized um, tribal boundaries where they're able to practice those burns. And the state of California actually passed a law this past January that allows um, cultural burning, um, or historically, you actually those that like prescribed fire know have to have a, a you know government approved prescribed fire crew. You couldn't just set fire, um, and totally change the the, the you know the, the freedom around that practice in a, in a positive way, as well as the lands that that can occur on. But again, it doesn't substitute for land, but it is at least acknowledging um, access to on um, those areas to practice those those stewardship um, approaches. But yeah, not. So it's a drop in the bucket relative to what should occur. Thank you. Got time for two or three more questions. Thank you. As I'm sure many folks in this room live in Burlington or nearby, what are the main ways that you need help that we could help? Do you mean in the gardens or in general? Anything. Um, well, we, like I said, do you know where Ethan Allen Homestead is? Okay, so behind that, we have a garden and can't seem to get a lot of people to volunteer to help me except for that man right there behind you. Luke waves so everybody can see. He is the best volunteer I have. Um, he's awesome. People can come and help me. We're going to be in a couple weeks. I'm going to be putting the garden to bed, but it's it's more interesting at the beginning, you know, in the spring when we're planning things and then you start seeing things grow and I sing to the garden. I drum and I sing to the garden every time I go to see it and knowing that it it warms my heart because I'm doing things that my ancestors did. So you can do you can volunteer. We're there. Everybody knows me there. So I mean, all you have to do is ask, but. I, I can't think of I live in Burlington also. I live in the South End, so. You can come and help me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> help me in my garden. But volunteers are always great and it's really hard to get people to commit to to help. You know, lots of times it's if I can't if Luke doesn't help me, then I'm by myself doing things. 
and weeding and whatever else I happen to be doing because I'm the guardian of the land there. So I, I have to do it all. I do everything you now. And again, we don't own that land. It belongs to Winooski Park District, but they're basically lending us the land so we can have gardens to teach people, you know, how to garden and what we grew, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago and the way that we did it. So that's what you can do. You can come volunteer for me if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you. Others? Oh, he's over there. I think he was over. You keep shutting your thing off. I know it's a bad habit. <laughs> I'll throw one for both of you, please. One of the one of the film's major points I felt was that there's been this transition, and you've both talked about it in the ways that lands have been used. In moving to a different view of the land, are there ways you've seen people be more accepting of these new ideas? Are there ways of presenting them that you found successful in drawing people in in your own experience to being curious or more engaged or more involved. Jeez. Well, the way I draw people in um, is they have tours at the homestead and usually people come and they talk to me and I explain to them what I'm doing in the in the gardens like I did with you. And then I give them squash. We have tons of squash in the fall. <laughs> and I gave sure it's squash. But that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to explain, you know, tell people. I'm not out there in the street telling people, but but I am giving people tours of, you know, the village and the gardens and I explain, you know, what we did, what's or whatever. And then you take a walk down the river and it's beautiful because there's all kinds of medicinal plants down there as you walk. And then you hear the water and terrible. Yeah, I would say obviously with prescribed fire and cultural burning, uh, there's, there's a highly enthusiastic group or just likes to think about fire and in the use of that as a tool. And I think being able to tie that to, to uses beyond again people often get introduced to it to reduce fire risk and all these kind of modern issues but really to tie it back to a long-term stewardship of the land and what that's meant for resilience for millennia and kind of how that that plays into kind of a broader perspective of fire but i'd also say from a forestry standpoint um you know relative to agriculture it's evolved quite rapidly from kind of the production model of the you know pines and lines and, and having things just be plantations um, and really in the past 30 years there's been much more discussion of ecological forestry and ecological silviculture and so again it never gives full credit to where those ideas already resided and certainly again the Menominee talk about what, how they've been practicing that for centuries on their land but I think certainly that, that element of managing with the ecosystem and but still certainly deriving goods and services from it but doing it in a way that's more consistent with kind of how that ecosystem functions um, most students and, and I personally get more excited about that as a model going forward. And again, there's, there's many examples within um, kind of woodland tribes throughout the Northeast and certainly throughout the, the country and globe that have, have been doing those practices for a long time. So I would say that those are places where it intersects with what we do and people are, are excited about it. Thank you. So in the movie, uh, they frequently spoke about uh, themes and topics such as uh, religion and or culture being very related to management practices, working with disturbances and not fighting disturbances, but working with them. Uh, and I know in forestry, at UVM, we talk about uh, especially silviculture being an art 
and a science, but we don't talk about that cultural aspect of it. Um, as someone who is studying forestry and natural resources and sustainability, uh, how can we make it easier for people not to have to learn a different language when they're talking to different people and how can we incorporate the cultural aspects into the scientific and the art aspects of land management and caring for places so something just popped in my mind maybe i don't know does uvm have a cultural abnac here native american studies thing oh i think that would be a really good thing because or and i keep saying this i can teach you a lot about culture about abnaki culture um a lot and and i can't go into it here but i think that would be the thing you really need to have you know, and not to be mean, you need you need an Abnaki or a Native American person to teach this class, not just anybody that went to school and learned, read books because you, you can't learn it that way. You ha it has to come from your heart. You know, it has to be in your soul. Did that help you? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I have questions. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I, I just want to contribute to that, what your point. Um, and so one thing that UVM has done is micro-credentialing so that uh, Native and Indigenous voices can be teaching at UVM to bring that knowledge forward. Um, so I think that's an important, um, it's, a, it's a very important component. And, and as the provost mentioned, uh, we're having that conversation around the idea of uh, Native Indigenous Studies faculty as well. That's awesome. I mean, we'll be hiring a traditional ecological knowledge faculty member within Rubenstein School, and, and certainly that you know I'm on that search and would really value, yeah, of course, a forest perspective, but also, um, yeah, a, a tribal voice in that position. Um, I could be guest speaker. <laughs> you great. He keeps turning it off. <laughs> <laughs> One last thing is, which is that I think the question really gets at the point of what does it mean to indigenize a cur curriculum? And you you made the point of like in a lot of disciplines, it's like we have to learn the entire European heritage of a discipline before we can kind of start thinking about a different perspective. And so I think it it gets down to what do we what knowledge do we center? What knowledge do we consider? How do we uh, reconcile those different kinds of knowledge at the center of, of our curriculum. And so I think that that's ongoing work, right, across so many different areas of our academic um, effort at this institution and, and in higher education more broadly. Time for one more short question, if there's You shut it off again. I think you shut it off again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, I want to thank you. I want to especially ask that we give a big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Holly and Tony, I deeply appreciate you giving your time, thought, and energy to this event. And I think the audience has shown their real interest and we've had a really good turnout. So thank you all for making this possible. Thank you, Masha, for the online stuff. And just to add, people are asking some things. We put together a small list of resources. Um, if there are, and those are things that are at the, um, either books you can get, some of them are at the library, and there are also some films. So thank you all very much. Looks like everybody's doing the famous screenshots, so if you can keep flipping back and forth between the two of them, Masha, <laughs> that'll be time. great for folks.